Good afternoon, colleagues and friends. I welcome you to the 17th annual W. Montague Cobb NMA Health Lectureship and Symposium. I am Randall C. Morgan, Jr. I proudly serve as the president and the CEO of the W. Montague Cobb NMA Health Institute. Since its founding in 2004, the Institute has served as a national consortium of scholars that engage in innovative research and knowledge dissemination for the reduction and elimination of racial and ethnic health disparities and racism in medicine. It was conceived as a strategy used by the National Medical Association to respond to the call for action by the well-known and often referred to publication, Unequal Treatment, Confronting Racial and Ethnic Health Disparities in Health Care, produced by the National Academies in the year 2003, and contributed to by several members of the National Medical Association. As the Cobb Institute has matured, it has understood that the elimination of racial and ethnic health disparities has been an elusive target. And we have to come to focus upon the strategies to achieve health equity. These annual lectureships and symposium topics have focused upon current challenges in health and in health care that require collaborative and multidisciplinary approaches and solutions. There is no more important topic affecting the health of the nation and global health as well than the one we will focus upon today. From Hopwood to Harvard, anti-affirmative action in higher education, admissions, and amidst systemic racism and historical racial inequities in health is our topic today. I had the honor of serving as the 97th president of the National Medical Association during the years 1996 to 1997. During that period, Hopwood versus the state of Texas and Proposition 209 in California dominated the agenda of the National Medical Association and the AAMC as well. We will hear today about how the impact of those legislative measures are measured or affected by the recent Supreme Court decision. It has also been my honor to serve as a member of the steering committee of an organization called Movement is Life, originally originated by Zimmer Biomet. It is now a 501c3 composed of multidisciplinary uh, individuals who also share the same mission and vision as the Cobb Institute. The concept for the symposium today came from a panel presented during the National Caucus of Movement is Life in Washington, D.C. on November the 10th, 2022. The legal concepts that related to the anticipated decision of the Supreme Court in June of 2023 initiated the planning of this symposium today. Therefore, the National Medical Association and the Cobb Institute were on this issue some time ago and not just last week. I would like to acknowledge the financial support of Movement is Life and the sponsorship of this lectureship and symposium, as well as the National Medical Association today. I would like to thank, and in particularly, Verona Bruton and other members of the Movement is Life Steering Committee, and I would like to ask that they stand and be acknowledged today. Verona. Thank you. The important part of the planning for this symposium was the selection of the W. Montague Cobb lecturer. We are honored today to have Dr. Ruth Simmons to serve in this role today. Her presence was facilitated by another steering committee member of Movement is Life, 
and also a former board member of the Cobb Institute, Dr. Augustus White. We're very anxious to begin this important program today, and I would like to introduce to you Dr. Tamara Huff, who will serve as the moderator today. Dr. Huff serves as a member of the Board of Directors of Movement is Life and as an active member of the National Medical Association and a contributor to the orthopedic uh, section. You might have noticed that you'll be surrounded by orthopedic surgeons today, uh, but it's okay. It's, it's, uh, it's a good thing. But Dr. Huff has completed her MBA at uh, Duke and um, is doing great things not only for moving his life, but for America. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tammy, Tamara Huff. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. We have an absolutely phenomenal panel today. I would actually like our panelists to come on up and join me on stage. And again, we're having everyone start on stage, but we're actually gonna be welcomed by Dr. Simmons first. So again, we want to remind everyone of our learning objectives today. We need to talk about the legal actions and precedents for use of affirmative action and what we are going to do in the wake of the new ruling. Also too, we highlighted some of the different um, opportunities that are coming up and we will be going through each one of these things, okay? So today I have the pleasure of serving as the moderator. We'll begin with a keynote from our le Cobb lecturer, Dr. Ruth Simmons, who I will formally introduce shortly. Following her address, we will hold audience questions, and I'll introduce the remaining members of our roundtable who are formidable leaders and champions of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So let's get started. Dr. Ruth Simmons is a distinguished presidential fellow at Rice University and advisor to the president of Harvard University on engagement with historically black colleges and universities. In this role, Dr. Simmons will champion the recommendations of the presidential committee on Harvard and the legacy of slavery, as well as foster meaningful and enduring partnerships with the nation's HBCUs. Dr. Simmons has an illustrious career centered on leadership in higher education. She served as president of Smith College, of Brown University, and most recently of Prairie View A&M University. She is a sought after member for corporate and nonprofit boards across medicine, education, industry, and finance. She has served on the board of Pfizer, Goldman Sachs, Howard University, Princeton University, and Chrysler. Dr. Simmons earned her bachelor's degree in French from, here, from Dillard University here in New Orleans, and doctorate degrees in Romance Languages and Literature from Harvard. Let's give a warm welcome for Dr. Ruth Simmons. Thank you. Um, he called you Tammy. Are you known by that name? I am known by Tammy, Tamara. Okay, well, I'm going to call you Tammy. <clears throat> now, how many of you have been professors? Okay, a few of you have been. Well, you'll know that it's not that great speaking into an audience that's spread out the way you are. Okay, and the first thing we do in our classes is to say, can't you arrange yourselves more like an audience? Um, and so I'm going to ask you, yes, I'm going to ask you, if you will, to move up so that this panel can feel that they're interacting with an engaged uh, audience. And if you don't, just remember that the doors will be locked and you're not going to be able to get out early. <laughs> um, 
Well, much thanks, uh, of course, is due to a number of people for uh, arranging this important uh, discussion today. But before I go into that, I, I, I have to say, I just want to know who arranged the playlist. Okay, uh, because a lot of us were commenting that, that that was just the best playlist we've heard, okay? Um, wouldn't you agree? So uh, we, we want the reference to whoever did that so that you know, for all of those events that we go to where we have to listen to music that's, yeah, you know, uh, acceptable, but, um, but that was uh, thoroughly enjoyable. Uh, thank you again, Tammy. Uh, thanks to um, Dr. Morgan. I am pleased to be with uh, the distinguished representatives of this vital human-centered profession. As I begin, I want to acknowledge the importance, first of all, of the work that you all do day in and day out to save lives, to heal a variety of afflictions, to provide hope for those on the margins, and in so many other ways, care for the breadth of human needs. Gatherings such as this are always important, but they are especially so in these times. For this is a strange and challenging time for those of us who dedicate our lives to the well-being of marginalized groups. Powerful forces are deploying every means at their disposal to roll back perceived advances by minorities and other um, underserved groups, inciting animus by the most venal means possible, their actions not only inflict harm on those whose rights are brutally curtailed and upended, more importantly, they circumvent opportunities for young people from the time they emerge from their mother's wombs. Left to their devices, the world will be remade in the image of those whom they wish to hold undiluted power. The power sought would reign not only over their economic well-being and political enfranchisement, but just as troubling in areas that greatly affect an individual's right to self-respect, to understanding their history and culture, and other means of acquiring the health and happiness to which they are entitled as human beings. But you know that's the thing about it. It's so pernicious because why do they care that we want to understand our history? Why do they care? Because they want to reshape the way we think about ourselves and, and reshape and demolish our sense of dignity and our will to fight. Um, we cannot let that happen. In their ideal world, truth and honor hold no sway. Yes, this is the era of the reign of falsehood in the service of the retention of power by powerful interests. The modus operandi for this assault on the underserved is incitement, as I said, of animus by the broad public and the strategic placement of sympathizers in positions to roll back gains. Both tactics are proving successful because of fear and distaste among some about the demographic shifts that they believe imperil the power dynamic once securely held by a majority. The simple truth is that they desire this power to be held in perpetuity, no matter the makeup or evolution of society. This is the political dynamic that facilitated the actions of an individual, an individual who sought to plot the demise of affirmative action. It is also the dynamic that imperils all references to the history of slavery and racial discrimination. Now the wedge chosen for this nefarious deed was a buzzword that was vague enough to win widespread agreement, merit. Outside of the historical context, 
the goal of a meritocratic society can certainly be appealing. Being worthy of rewards because of outstanding achievement is in the abstract an unassailable ideal. But when considered in the historical and present context, merit has been little more than a superficial acknowledgement that individuals should earn their way. Yet in practice, it has become culturally encoded in ways to retain power and access for a dominant group. While proudly verbalized as a pristine ideal, the practice of decisions based solely on merit is little more than a sham. Let's examine for a moment how definitions of merit have varied and been used at, to advantage different groups over time. When Jews were thought to be a threat to the existing power, organizations and institutions were willing to ignore their manifest academic accomplishments. Similarly, brilliant Asian African Americans were denied access purely on the basis of racial bias. Asian American numbers were often artificially depressed to avoid a perceived overrepresentation in some areas. Interpretation of merit and use of merit in access has always been about politics. And so the recent affirmative action decision should be seen as further evidence of the true platform on which, which issues of fairness stand in this country. Students for fair admission, therefore, use the political context for this battle over affirmative action. In such a context, how can one not only judge who is worthy, but do so in a way that protects decision making from the political process? Well, I've long held that universities are actually best able to judge fitness for successful academic pursuit and subsequent contributions to society. Yet, we have all too often seeded interpretations and applicability of qualifications and potential to others. We use school rankings, tests that have been shown to be culturally and economically biased, insider preferences, the influence of powerful elites, and so on to dictate what or who merits acceptance or advancement. As educators who understand mind work better than any, we do not call upon and insist upon our unique experience and intimate knowledge of the learning process to make and defend decisions about who is worthiest be chose to be chosen for admission and appointment. I often tell this um, story as an example. When I was uh, working on recruiting faculty at Princeton, I thought it would be wonderful if the writer Toni Morrison um, were given a, a faculty appointment at Princeton. Well, that was more complicated than I thought it would be. It turns out that Toni Morrison was at the time a faculty member at, the, at SUNY Albany. Well, Princeton didn't recruit from SUNY Albany. Um, also, she didn't have a PhD, and yet the English department taught her works. Okay. Um, so when it came to the appointment and I approached her about considering Princeton, um, she said, and I said, we'll need a dossier. She said, well, if they don't know my work, I don't want to go to Princeton. That, that was Toni Morrison. Um, when she finally made it through and was offered an appointment, the English department refused to give her an appointment because she didn't have a PhD and she, wasn't, she didn't have the right lineage. Now these judges of work, of literature, did not have the wherewithal to judge whether Toni Morrison was worthy of an appointment at Princeton, but they would not. They would not. So I'm not in favor of these proxies that we use to judge people's worth. I believe we should do the hard work of thinking through what people bring 
and how that can be useful to society. Of course, after she won the Pulitzer Prize, and after she won the Pulitzer Prize, and soon thereafter the Nobel Prize, they pretended that they were happy all along to have her as a faculty member at Princeton. And every time I go back to Princeton, I, re I remind them of this narrative, um, because the narrative, of course, has changed. Um, who is more fit to judge the extent to which a student is likely to benefit from and usefully deploy what is available to be learned on a particular campus or in a particular field than the people on that campus? Yet we permit novices to tell us how we must decide on merit in the context of our profession. And I don't care if you're a Supreme Court justice, and I don't care if you're a governor or any other politician. Um, nobody knows the work, the mind work, that is required on our campuses better than we. And so one of the problems that I have is that educators don't stand up to this intrusion. To me, this is what we have to wage war against, and we have to defend our ability to be expert in this process. We are the experts. I chose a career in higher education because I see nothing comparable to its ability to elevate the life chances of human beings to their fullest potential. And that's why I believe it's important to focus on access to education in its full array of enriching activities and in its affording learning from the encounter with different views. But of course, little of that can meaningfully occur unless we work ceaselessly to alleviate the legacy of bias and discrimination that crept into the policies and practices of universities in previous eras. Practices that once banned certain groups from admission altogether. Policies that imposed judgments about human worth based on biased preferences and perspectives. Practices that judged everyone on how close they came to a deliberately non-inclusive and purposefully elitist ideal. So to be clear, whatever the future holds for the selection and admission process, we must not defer to others to tell us who is fit to learn or enter a profession. Can we at least agree on that? Confidence Confidence in one's expertise is best shown by standing tall and speaking up when others attempt to wrest control away from those who know best. If you believe you know best when it comes to your profession, you must speak to that, you must fight for that. And I must say, I feel all too often as educators, we have permitted others to take control over a process that we can exclusively handle well. Now, as far as the recent Supreme Court decision, I'll say this, social justice remedies are always subject to the political winds of the times. Solutions to social ills created by differential status among groups may garner enough support for a time, but, when power shifts occur, any measures put in place, any measures, no matter how sensible they seem for the time, can be reviewed, redesigned, or even canceled altogether. We must never forget that this is a political process that we're involved in. And political processes are subject to power dynamics at a given moment. So in that sense, we should see the recent decision as just another moment in the evolution of anti-discrimination and full inclusion measures. Yes, some will be taken aback by the throwback to a darker era, but it's important to see this as a continuing struggle to validate the place of those who are denied the consideration and access they deserve. Now, I have to say, and I remind people all the time, that 
remembering my childhood, the thing that was so discouraging as a child of segregation was not so much that um, we were hated and reviled and blocked from admission. It was the fact that people didn't fight hard enough for the access that we deserved. So to me, every person who has any um, responsibility of any measure in society today must show to young people that we are fighting for them. We must, because that's what gives them the wherewithal to continue and to believe that something different can happen in the end. And the only way I got to do that was because I had teachers who really um, had a vision for where I could go when I could have none. For teachers who worked to say what I could do when everything in society said I could do nothing. That's so important for you to remember that people are looking to you for that encouragement. <laughs> Students for fair admission versus Harvard used a ruse to conquer and overturn decades of practice. That ruse included using a veneer of minority interest to overturn the rights of other minorities. Very clever. Minorities against the minorities. The drama thus played out as an internecine struggle rather than what it actually was, the strategy of an anti-affirmative action conservative to undo affirmative action. Christopher Caldwell, in a June 8, 2023 essay in the New York Times, argues that this result is due in part to changing demographics. He notes that the balance of whites to non-whites in the country caused the moral ground to fall out from under affirmative action. In other words, affirmative action in the context of today's demographics is immoral. Never mind the long history of discrimination and what it takes to overcome that history. So he continues, we've gone from a perceived biracial society where affirmative action disadvantaged a few whites, such that very few whites felt the effect. And now Hispanics having increased significantly in number and African and Caribbean students given access to affirmative action the policy is clearly no longer a remedy for those who had experienced historic discrimination. Well, that should prompt the question, at least it does for me, what would be the remedy for historic discrimination then? The Harvard case hinged on the argument that Asian students on average have been considerably more qualified than other groups. The proof that their admission numbers had stalled in recent selective institutions, in spite of their growing numbers in the population, prompted the belief that such actions amounted to quotas. Now, that had been going on for decades. From Berkeley all the way across the country, Asian Americans were complaining about stalled admission numbers. The manifest injustice of that behavior does not prevent our seeing the undertones of the case for what it is. Using Asian Americans as a wedge in the battle to end affirmative action may not prove in days ahead to have been conservatives' finest hour, because if one follows the data they exploit to its logical conclusion and insist that Asians be treated as they deserve, this will hardly be good news for the whites the action was meant to reward. So follow that and see what happens. Indeed, the ruling sets a new late legal basis, I think, for attacking the bias against Asians in lots of realms. But now this decision is made, and a particular approach to considering race when judging qualifications is unlawful, how are we to assure that we can continue to overturn the deeply entrenched legacy of racism, segregation, and discrimination that has marked so much of the history of our country. In my view, all is not lost if we pursue this goal with purpose and integrity, remembering that every policy and practice must withstand the scrutiny of others who are intent on judging 
the fairness of our actions. I've most recently served as president of an HBCU, Prairie View a and University. Once named, I sought to appoint a provost who could oversee and improve the quality of our academic programs. The most qualified person on campus happened to be a white man, and I appointed him to the position. And he was very white. In fact, you know, when people questioned this, um, and, you know, I said, well, look at him. Yes, he's very white. He is a white man. <laughs> My decision was met with withering criticism that the position somehow belonged to a black person. No. It belonged to the person best able to carry out the program that I had in mind. When we entertain narrow ideas and discriminate, we do no more than lay the groundwork for undermining our efforts to address discrimination writ large. That brings me to what I think will be essential as we contemplate where we go from here. First of all, our admissions and selection practices must follow logically from our stated mission and aims. The weakness cited in the Harvard case, one weakness cited in the Harvard case, was that Harvard's practices did not align with their use of race as a factor in admission. In other words, you can't argue that difference makes a difference in the academic context if you're not intentionally creating a campus environment in which students can take proper advantage of that difference. So if we argue that we have shaped admission in alignment with a particular purpose, our actions must demonstrate that we take that purpose seriously. So our efforts must begin with a statement of our aims in the admission process. So often today, such statements read like a public relations piece. Thoughtful, transparent statements of one's aims can be a beacon to students, a guide to faculty and other supporters, and a protection against unfounded attacks. If we say one thing and our actions disprove what we advertise, we are deserving of the criticism that is sure to follow. That statement should include the institution's unique relevance to its mission. Could be social justice, it could be local and regional um, prominence, it could be in regard to specific profes professions and their needs, it could be in regard to uh, programmatic areas that we offer at our universities. The design and makeup of the admission process should reflect those aims and the institution's context. In other words, if you have a specific social justice mission, why are you not leaning heavily into what a student has done in that arena prior to applying? If you emphasize the quality of campus offerings, why are you not specifying that evidence of extracurricular excellence is highly desired. For the most part, universities have been haphazard in their design of their qualifications, no matter what you, what you hear them say. Admission has been governed by GPAs, test scores, and oh, by the way, other stuff added in. We will have to be far more specific about the weight of what comes after the and in admission and align those attributes with how they help us address our mission. The importance of future potential, in my view, is one of the most important yet underutilized dimensions of admission decisions. How does one view and weigh potential relative to other factors? Do we summon examples that we may have seen in other students with similar profiles? Is such a trajectory evident in the dossier? If so, how? We must learn to describe how we measure potential, for it can be one of the most important ways of meeting our mission, especially if that mission focuses on early generation learners and future leaders in the arena of social justice. You know, as, a, as an educator of, you know, associated with so-called elite institutions, I'm not supposed to. Um, uh, I'm not supposed to say that we often miss the mark in what we should be doing 
with people who have potential. And um, I'm certainly one who, I can't imagine why I even got into college, to be perfectly honest with you. But what I like to say is while my chances of going to college were slim, the fact that I can prove that I can lead an Ivy League university ought to tell people that there's something wrong with the system we're using to judge what people can do. Um, I'm just saying. Recruitment and feeder institutions become more important in this new environment. A bevy of institutions will now be forming partnerships with diversity-rich schools as a way of broadening diversity on campuses. However, there are other reasons for using this tried and true method of improving our campuses. Most institutions tend toward the parochial, upholding existing features of its environment as somehow a unique brand. Partnerships with different types of institutions bring new perspectives to our work and at the same time beneficially expand our visibility to different communities. I think we all know that staffing and leadership in admission has, required new pro has acquired new prominence and importance. The process of admission cannot be a paper shuffling function relying on recording test scores and securing transcripts, which it is in many institutions. Heads of admission must be, should be those with deep academic experience, qualified to render policies that reflect the institutional mission and make judgments that match those policies. Admission staff will need to be well-trained and have experience relevant to the admission profile created. Now, this... Um, really says that we're going to be spending a lot more money on admissions, a lot more money. Um, and we're going to be more focused and more intentional in our admission process. Recruitment will play an even greater role now as the need for outreach to areas consistent with the university's mission will demonstrate the sincerity of our effort. Finally, universities must assess where test scores and GPAs fit into their standards. If they are one of many factors, that must be clear. I'll never forget when I was president of Brown, I, I was walking down the street and a student called to me and said, President Simmons, may I talk to you? I said, sure. He came over, he said, I came to Brown, I'm from a local school, I came to Brown to do engineering, but I didn't have calculus in my high school. How am I going to be able to do engineering? There are a lot of students that don't have access to the prerequisite courses in their high schools. What are you going to do about that? You have to offer the means for those students to make their way through the curriculum. And thank God we had our best professor in mathematics take the challenge on and to help this student qualify for admission to engineering. Were I designing an admission process today, I would include the following factors in viewing qualifications. The difference of experience and talents that the applicant would offer in the cohort such that he or she would add to the learning of fellow students. I would design campus learning to exploit these differences. You can't just say, I admitted a student because they played the uh, cello if you don't have any idea what that's going to mean for the campus community. Uh, we are no longer in an environment where we can willy-nilly say that somebody was different and therefore we admitted them on that basis. How are they to fit in your um, vision of what a campus community uh, should be. The disadvantage a student may have had in reaching this stage in their academic career should count for a lot. How much harder have they had to work to accomplish what others have with, uh, without similar impediments? Um, I've seen so many students over the years who've had a privileged educational background all the way to college, who are not nearly as good as students who have come from the worst 
um, academic ba uh, background, but work hard to overcome those, um, uh, those uh, shortfalls. Um, how much harder they had to work to get to where they are is an important human factor that we ought to take very seriously, in my view. Uh, I would emphasize personal qualities um, that could play a major role in how a, system, uh, a student um, achieves, such as independence of mind, evidence of creativity and curiosity, determination and resilience. And I suppose one of the reasons I managed to get to um, college was because as a 16-year-old, as a 17-year-old, I was completely insufferable. Um, and that must have indicated to somebody that I was going to be tenacious enough uh, to be able to survive in, in college. Um, they may have later regretted that after what I did on campus. Um, you may discern that I do not see the Supreme Court decision as the end of measures to overturn the sordid history of discrimination in this country. I see it rather as an opportunity for us to deepen our concern for those excluded from opportunity. I see it as a time to work hard to ensure that we're paying attention to those who still are left standing on the outskirts of opportunity and justice. So my hope is in this um, aftermath of the decision, we will dig down and apply ourselves to this work as never before and not waste our time decrying the politics that brought us to this point. I know you are all in for this, for the duration, and I am too. Future generations are counting on that. They are counting on you. Thank you. Again, let's do one more round of applause for Dr. Simmons. Thank you. Thank you. We could not have asked for a better level set as we transition to this phenomenal panel. I will now begin to introduce the additional members of our panel. So as you know, you've already met Dr. Simmons, who is absolutely phenomenal. Our next presenter is going to be Ms. Michelle Turnage Young, who serves as senior counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, where she litigates education cases. She served as counsel in Arnold v. Barbers Hill Independent School District where the court enjoined enforcement of a dress code provision that sought to suspend students who wore uncut natural locks. <laughs> Go figure, you. <laughs> Ms. Turner Young also represented Harvard student and alumni organizations as an advisor to the court in Students for Fair Admissions v. Harvard. In this role, she co-authored briefs arguing that the court should uphold settled law allowing universities to consider race as one of many factors in admission. Prior to joining the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in 2017, Ms. Tur Mrs. Turnage Young served as a trial attorney for the Educational Opportunities Section of the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, where she prosecuted 13 school desegregation cases in seven federal court jurisdictions. Mrs. Turnage Young earned her law degree from Harvard Law School and her undergraduate degree from UCLA. Round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> to, my, to my left and our next panelist is Dr. Frederick, who was appointed as the 17th president of Howard University in 2014. As president, Dr. Frederick has overseen a series of reform efforts, including the expansion of academic offerings, establishing innovative programs to support student success, and the modernization of university facilities. 
Dr. Frederick re received his Bachelor's of Science and Medical Doctorate from Howard University. He completed his postdoctoral research and surgical oncology fellowships at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Frederick began his academic career as an associate director of the Cancer Center at the University of Connecticut, and upon his return to Howard, he served as an associate dean in the College of Medicine, division chief in the Department of Surgery, director of Cancer Center, and deputy provost for health sciences. He also earned a Master's of Business Administration from Howard University School of Business. Most recently, the Howard University Board of Trustees selected Dr. Frederick to serve as the distinguished Charles R. Drew Professor of Surgery. Again, let's welcome Dr. Frederick. <laughs> Moving along, we're going on to Dr. Bonnie Simpson Mason who is the inaugural Medical Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the American College of Surgeons. Prior to this role, Dr. Simpson Mason served as Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, also known as the ACGME. She supported efforts to address harassment, discrimination, and other forms of mistreatment in graduate medical education. During her time at the ACGME, Dr. Mason led the design, development, and implementation of the ACGME's Equity Matters, a 10-year-long continuous learning and process improvement initiative in DEI and anti-racism, actively engaging over 1,000 members of the GME community and specialty organizations. The program incorporates education, peer advising, and solutions developing the goal of addressing disparities and racism while achieving health equity. Dr. Simpson Mason earned her Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from Howard University, you may see a theme here, <laughs> and her medical degree from Morehouse School of Medicine. <laughs> she completed a general surgery internship at UCLA and returned to Howard University to complete her orthopedic surgery residency. She is founder of Inf Dimensions, a pipeline program to increase the number of underrepresented minorities in medicine. Welcome, Dr. Simpson Mason. And to the man that does not need any introduction <laughs> to everyone here, is Dr. Garfield Clooney, who is the 123rd president of the National Medical Association and the an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology in the Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine and vice chair of diversity, equity, and inclusion at the New York University Grossman School of Medicine and NYU Langone Health. He also serves as director of the perinatal department at White Plains Hospital Center. Prior to NYU, Dr. Clooney served as an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Science at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. As a faculty member, Dr. Clooney supervises the OBGYN Diagnosis and Treatment Center's high-risk clinics and ultrasound unit. After receiving a Bachelor's of Science in Biochemistry from SUNY at Stony Brook, Dr. Clooney earned his medical degree from Bowman Gray School of Medicine. He completed a residency in obstetrics and gynecology at NYU Downtown Hospital and went on to complete a fellowship in maternal fetal medicine at Tufts New England Medical Center. Welcome again, Dr. Clooney. So as you can tell, we have this illustrious panel, but we're gonna begin with Ms. Turnage Young. And just as a reminder, nothing shared today by Mrs. Turnage Young constitutes legal advice. <laughs> um, we'll begin because we will begin and have her share her top three things that we should know about this most recent Supreme Court decision. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Huff. Thank you, Dr. Morgan and the Cobb Institute for having me. 
Um, so as many of you know, the Supreme Court struck down Harvard's and UNC's race-conscious admissions policies back on June 29th. Um, they struck them down as unconstitutional, reasoning that the policies, however well-intentioned and implemented in good faith, failed to pass uh, constitutional muster under strict scrutiny because the policies were not narrowly tailored to a compelling government interest. Now, this was the case even though the court called the pursuit of the educational benefits of diversity uh, compelling, or sorry, plainly worthy, commendable goals. In so holding, the court undermined almost five decades of precedent by applying a radical and much more stringent version of strict scrutiny than it had applied in the past. Now, I always get a lot of questions from people about like, well, why is it that remedying societal racial discrimination is not enough for the court? Um, what I can tell you is that the court once again rejected the idea that remedying societal discrimination is a compelling government interest that can justify race-based state action. In the court's view, the interest in remedying racial discrimination is, quote, an amorphous concept of injury that may be ageless in its reach into the past, end quote, and threatens to, quote, open the door to competing claims for remedial relief for every disadvantaged group, end quote, based on, quote, inherently unmeasurable claims of past wrongs, quote, end quote, that, quote, cannot justify a racial classification that imposes disadvantages upon persons who bear no responsibility for whatever harm the beneficiaries of race-based admissions program are thought to have suffered, end quote. So top three things that you should know about this decision. First, despite how alarming this decision is, it is important to know exactly what the Supreme Court did and did not decide. The court's decision is limited to the consideration of race as a tip in college admissions as conducted by Harvard and UNC in pursuit of the educational benefits of diversity. Now, in a footnote, the court made clear that the question of race-conscious admissions in military schools was not a question that was before it. The, co the court noted that those schools may have some distinct interests. The court um, also made clear that this is not about the use of race in admissions to remedy uh, intentional racial discrimination. It is also not the case that this decision is about outreach, recruitment, affinity groups, employment, contracting, race-neutral policies governing K-12 selective admissions programs. It's not about diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility programs. It is not about ESG goals or environment, social, and governance goals. It is not about critical race theory. It's not about the use of uh, as I said, it's not about the use of race-conscious admissions for remedial purposes. So notably, a lot of those things become much more important in light of the Supreme Court's decision. The second thing that you should know is that the court explicitly made clear that, quote, nothing in its opinion should be construed as prohibiting universities from considering an applicant's discussion of how race affected his or her life, be it through discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise. Indeed, the court recognizes that what applicants share about their experiences with race could indicate courage and determination or that student's unique ability to contribute to the university. Now, the third thing that we should all know is that we all have an important role to play in remedying the systemic racial discrimination that denies many black, Latinx, indigenous, Asian American, and Pacific Islander students an equal opportunity to a quality K-12 education and to compete for admission to our nation's selective universities and colleges. As of the 2020 to 2021 school year, it was the case that even though black students were 13% of US high school graduates, that they were only 6% of students enrolled in selective, large public colleges, while white students were 50% of high school graduates and 56% of students enrolled in large selective public colleges. We need to remind our alma maters and institutions of higher education writ large that they continue to have a responsibility under federal and state anti-discrimination laws to provide an equal opportunity to all applicants to compete for admission. And what that means is that they must ensure that they remove criteria 
from their admissions processes that unfairly deny some students an equal chance to compete for admission. Uh, you heard Dr. Simmons talk about a student who ha did not have the opportunity to take calculus at their high school. Well, it, it's still the case that only 50% of our public high schools offer calculus. Um, yet, unfortunately, many schools are still looking to see, does the applicant have calculus, and privileging that when they decide who to admit. Now, only 50% of our public high schools have calculus. Only 38% of high schools with predominantly black or Latinx enrollment offer calculus. So maybe it's unsurprising, especially given the research about how black students, Latinx students, tend to be tracked out of college preparatory classes even if they go to a school that offers those courses. Maybe it's unsurprising that only 9% of black high school students are graduating with calculus on their transcript in comparison to 22% of their white peers and in comparison to 50% of their Asian American peers. Likewise, according to a 2021 study, 29% of high schools in the country don't offer the courses required for um, admission to the STEM disciplines at their state public flagship universities. Now keep this in mind, their parents are paying the taxes that fund the state public flagship universities, but they are going to high schools that don't offer the courses that would enable them to even apply for those disciplines. We all have a responsibility to do what we need to do to make sure that we remove those barriers to equal opportunity. Thank you so much. That was absolutely excellent. We're gonna begin to open up the panel and we'll go and have some opening remarks from the rest of our panel. I'm going to start off with both first Dr. Frederick followed by Dr. Bonnie Simpson Mason to talk about, uh, talk a little bit about how institutions are going to be responding. Um, as we just spoke about, it's even more important to have diverse qualifications for admission, but also to address the pipeline and what's needed. And how does that vary from how an HBCU may respond versus a majority institution or even a state school that might not even have students have the qualifications or have the opportunity to have the qualifications to actually attend their institutions. So I'll start off again with Dr. Fredericks to just tell us how Howard is responding to this um, and how he sees HBCUs possibly responding to this. Yeah, sure. Um, first, let me uh, thank you for the invitation and certainly uh, I think uh, the opportunity for the NMA to have um, Dr. Simmons here I think is a, is a very unique opportunity and while you know, many in the audience um, probably may not have come across Dr. Simmons uh, in their medical training, uh, Dr. Simmons represents an American icon in higher education. So certainly I think we should give her another round of applause. Uh, our higher education institutions, in my humble opinion, are here for the amplification of other people's humanity. The ultimate reason that we exist is to bring young people to our institutions and have them fulfill their potential to amplify other people's humanity. The ability to look at somebody else and to see their circumstance and their situation, to not have their lived experience, but to be willing to pursue a path of education and then subsequently a profession of any kind that helps better somebody else's circumstance is the ultimate reason that we exist. And so with that in mind, I think a decision like this is very harmful because it breaks down the opportunity for us to diversify exactly who gets to participate in that amplification of other people's humanity. And for a society, as always, uh, that incompleteness um, that will be underscored and even highlighted um, is something that we have to be very concerned about. HBCUs represent 3% of our higher education institutions in this country, but are responsible for over 20% of the bachelor's degrees in STEM disciplines that are awarded to African Americans in this country. HBCUs carry an outsized burden with a very underfunded um, source of income when you look at how we put together our budgets, how we um, cover all of our, our expenses. And so a classic example of that is over the past two decades, Howard University has sent more African Americans to STEM PhD programs across this country than Stanford, MIT, Harvard, and Yale combined. Those four institutions have a combined endowment of $160 billion. 
Howard University's endowment will hit a billion, hopefully within the next three months or so. And that's to give you a perspective. <clears throat> Harvard University has an endowment of 54 billion. They can actually take their 5% spending rule that they use and take the 2.5 billion plus that that generates and run two Howard Universities without any single student paying tuition. They can pay all the faculty. They can keep all the lights on. They can run all the research labs twice over with just the 5% of their endowment. So the vast difference in resources is the other issue that we have to look at. If we have an, over, an outsized burden that we're putting on HBCUs to help diversify fields, but then we're not funding it through um, a multitude of sources, it, it's an issue. The other thing that I want you to be cognizant of that most of us do not realize is that the HBCU category, historically black colleges and universities, was a category that was actually created by the federal government. It was an amendment to the Higher Education Act in the 1960s that specifically identified a group of institutions that were created for the purpose of educating minorities, especially formerly enslaved people who were moving from the South. That's a very important concept to recognize because that funding source that was created is part of the slippery slope that I am concerned about that would be under attack by a Supreme Court decision. So I think Dr. Simmons is, is absolutely right in terms of us being vigilant, but we have to be more than just vigilant. I think there's an opening of a door now to start to question why should you, as a federal government, if you are not gonna support race-based admissions, why should you support race-based funding of these particular institutions that are already underfunded? And so I think that's something else that we have to be very cognizant of. We have a significant increase in applications, 34,000 applications this past year. Um, having, getting more applications is not of interest to Howard University. That's not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is an opportunity to be able to support the students who do apply so that we can increase the opportunity. We got 8,540 applications for medical school this year. Uh, we enrolled a class of 130. You could do the math. Those numbers are grave. However, almost 80 of those students only got into Howard. So that opportunity, despite those students being able to achieve in the classroom, volunteer, do all the things that you want a potential medical school applicant to do, that opportunity is not open for them everywhere. And if our black medical schools don't exist to train those doctors, we're gonna have a significant dearth in them. We would like to double the size of our medical school but again, that requires significant resources. So I think this decision in particular is troublesome. I think the way we're gonna respond is we're gonna to continue to do the things that allow for that selection bias. And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be very clear about this. I think there is a selection bias at Howard that favors providing those students with an opportunity. And in the discussion, I'll tell you how we use that selection bias because I do think uh, we could potentially be the target of lawsuits around that for giving students opportunities. The same way Dr. Simmons said, but it's, it won't be popular for those students of privilege who don't get the same opportunity. Dr. Simpson Mason. Uh, thank you um, once again for, for having me. Um, at the graduate medical education level, we're gravely concerned. Um, this is uh, the level of residency training um, that is far less um, where there's far less oversight. And while the, um, there's accreditation um, and regulations in place to dictate uh, the clinical and the surgical skills necessary to, um, for our doctors to matriculate all the way through and, and um, become board certified, there's less oversight around uh, dismissal. Um, we know that for our um, 15, um, let me back up. So we know that in gradu graduate medical education, um, in our specialties, especially surgery, and I'll start with that, you're three to six times more likely to be dismissed across all specialties of surgery than you are if you are white. Um, there's a study done recently, um, earlier this year, published in JAMA Surgery, that showed that for all specialties, women and those from underrepresented um, backgrounds were more likely more likely to be dismissed 
and the greatest level of disparate dismissal was for black Americans across all surgical specialties. We know that that, so despite the fact that now our students have a limited number of medical school spots to matriculate into and through, once we get to the graduate medical education level, we, um, we know that historically we're not retained because there's no accountability at that level for retention. Yes, recruitment, but not necessarily retention. And because of this ruling, we think that it will create, once again, a slippery slope um, and an opportunity for you know, far less uh, objective means to be used to continue to dismiss our residents. So we're um, extremely concerned about um, how to even address this. Um, looking globally, and I should say nationally, in terms of our um, faculty in graduate medical education, we believe that education in this space is critical. Um, if we're talking about DEI, not just starting with diversity, because we know diversity alone does not work by you know, adding people from diverse backgrounds into a majority space that has not taken the steps to critically prepare those within the space to support the diverse candidates, but that equitable practices have to be implemented such that the culture, the faculty, um, and the environment are ready to accept, promote, and support those residents all the way through successful matriculation. If that does not happen, we will continue to have the attrition. So just infusing any space with diverse candidates is not enough. But we can't say that we need you to make this environment more, um, uh, more inclusive without training, without education, such that those who are the silent um, supporters can then stand up to those who we know are continue to uphold um, the racist environments that our um, residents are facing, just simply trying to make it through residency training. Um, I tell the surgeons um, from the American College of Surgeons all the time, we can be tough without being toxic, but we have to understand what that anti-toxicity looks like. And it's gonna require that far more of those who don't look like us stand up to their colleagues and hold them accountable as we look at our levels of accountability from leadership to the organization to the faculty um, as it impacts our patients. We have to be able to hold each other accountable. And right now, I just don't think we're prepared to do that. And I think this affirmative action um, decision will continue to empower those who um, have the ability and power to compromise our ability to be successful matriculants through residency to do so successfully. So we're concerned. I think you just made so many great points, both Dr. Fredericks and Dr. Simpson Mason about the challenges that our undergrads are facing, of course, our graduate medical students and residents. I wanna to pose to Dr. Clooney next, how, how do we communicate to the larger community that this, cri this potential crisis in higher education actually affects them? I think many times people don't see how health disparities, so at Movement is Life, we talk about health disparities all this time, especially with women, African-American women, Hispanic women, rural women. We speak that language all the time, but we often see that people can't take how a health disparity is connected to the demographics of their physician. So we here, you, you may be preaching a little bit to the choir, but if you could share a little bit about how to message that, how to share that with our larger community to gain additional support. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you for including me in the panel. You know, I think that, um, like Dr. Simpson Mason said, it, it's very concerning, you know, what has happened, but we do have to tease apart what they are taking away versus what is still available. Um, and we also, when you look at health disparities, we have to look at the data that says race concordant care matters, right? And so if we start to take away that influx or pipeline of black applicants or black uh, trainees, that's gonna spiral into less black physicians to care for patients um, in underserved areas, which is where we tend to go um, and care for, you know, uh, uh, other black patients. And so that part of it to me is very concerning. I, um, I, 
at, at NYU, I, uh, I'm not sitting on the admissions committee yet, but I'm trying to get there um, because I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to navigate how the fact that medical school is now free there, how does that affect the demographics of what happens? And what I'm finding when I ask that question is, when you talk about diversity, everyone looks at it a very different way. And they start to say, well, is diversity really race? Is it zip code? Is it, you know, all these different things. And so, you know, the, the concern of, um, you know, potentially decreasing the amount of black students going into medicine because of these um, sort of restrictive efforts is quite concerning. And then um, we have to really look at our partnerships and our, um, our outreach and our mentorship programs to work with the AAMC, work with ACGME to craft a uh, strategy on how we're gonna educate our young folks to pr position themselves and present themselves so that they put themselves in the best light and the word race doesn't have to really play so much of a factor in their application. Thank you so much. I mean, I think that's so, so spot on because there are studies that actually show that patients who are taken care of by African-American physicians or by physicians that look like them do better mm -hmm. in primary care in um, neonatal care, newborns who are cared for by black physicians ha are half as likely in Florida to die. So this is really, really important. Yeah. I, w I want to again remind the audience, if you can scan the QR code, please feel free to submit a question. There's, we actually have a question from the audience that I think is really interesting and I would like to start off with uh, Dr. Simmons with this one because you began talking about it a bit. We have a lot of young people here in the audience. And that's one of the things I love about NMA is you have the posters, you have students who want to move through. What do these young people need to think about when they're trying to make, one, prepare their applications to try to see what institutions are going to be thinking of when you're not having that traditional application, where you're not just having a transcript, where you're trying to be more comprehensive? And then, so first part of the question is, what are the institutions probably going to be looking at? And second part of the question is, what should our students be looking at when they're trying to choose the right institution for them? So I'll start with Dr. Simmons, and I think Dr. Simpson Mason, this might be a great question for you as well. Well, I think uh, in short, it, it, we don't know yet how institutional policies will evolve. Um, and so it's hard to predict now what they will actually be looking for. I'm, a, I'm of the mind that young people really ought to focus on what is most important to their long-term sustainability as an integrated human being. That is far more important than the school you go to. It's far more important whether, whether or not somebody endorses what you've done in the past. It is um, essential to the success that you're going to have in the long run. And so as you think about applying, uh, apply fully as who you are. Uh, talk about the things that matter to you. Um, talk about the things that you would like to do with your life. Do not shape who you are in an application for the sake of the approbation of institutions. Um, and, and in the long run, I think, I mean, of course, it's easy for me to say because at my age and looking back over my life, the thing that I'm most grateful for is that I didn't change anything about myself in order to be successful. And I think in the long run, that will be much more satisfying than, than anything else. Um, I also think that um, it's very important for every person to have some idea of how they want to contribute to other people. Most universities are going to be persuaded um, that uh, you have value as a student if they see you not as focused on merely on what you can do, but focus on how you can be of assistance to other people because that's the enduring quality that makes a difference over time in terms of how uh, alumni perform, 
uh, how they made contributions, and ultimately how they contribute back to their own universities. So um, try to highlight what you're doing for other people um, and the way in which you see your future tied to that of others. Excellent. Thank you so much. Did you have anything? Um, just, just briefly, um, one of the things we're doing is encouraging the students to um, explain and demonstrate a narrative that bends towards excellence. Who are you and where do you shine greatest? What helps your, what brings your excellence to bear? Um, that is also the tie that we're um, bringing to bear at the American College of Surgeons in terms of our equity work period. That equity is necessary for excellence if in the delivery of quality and safe surgical care, and albeit all clinical care, that we have to have that equitable arm, even as demonstrated by the National Institute of Medicine back in 2001. It's not a new concept. So exploiting that idea that equity um, is tied to excellence um, at the institutional level, um, making sure that people understand that without equity, um, and without inclusion, you just, it's incomplete. You have an incomplete set of information, data, skill sets, and even physicians as we're talking about today versus um, otherwise. So tying everything to excellence is where we're going. I love it. I mean, that's the one thing, you can't go wrong with the pursuit of excellence. You can never go wrong with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to pose another question to Mrs. Turnage Young. We see challenges coming from every direction, it seems like, for diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. From a legal framework, where do you see the next level of legal challenges? Do you see it more coming from a national level? Do you see more of challenges coming from state levels? We just want to be vigilant. Where should we be looking for those challenges? Thanks for that question. Um, so we are already seeing challenges in the K-12 space to selective admissions programs at public schools. Um, we, these are not race conscious programs. They are completely different from the admissions policies challenged at Harvard and UNC. These are race neutral policies. Um, during the pandemic, we had a number of various school districts that decided we don't have vaccines yet it is not safe to bring our students together to take an admissions test. So they actually needed to change their policy because there were you know, uh, bans on bringing large groups of people together. Um, after several school districts changed their admissions policies to various selective admissions schools, um, we did see some fringe legal groups who brought equal protection challenges to those changes, alleging that doing something like getting rid of a $100 application fee, since all the students couldn't afford it, or getting rid of the admissions test because it was no longer safe to bring the children together to take the test, or screening every fifth grader for admission to a middle school magnet program. Those things were challenged as violations of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Um, the allegation was that removing those barriers to equal opportunity actually was the equivalent of racial discrimination against Asian American and white students. Um, so those are lawsuits that are percolating through the courts now. Um, let me be very clear, regardless of the fact that there are people who will bring lawsuits, just because you bring a lawsuit does not mean it has merit. Um, importantly, there is nothing at all that is illegal about removing barriers to equal opportunity. In fact, federal and state anti-discrimination laws require nothing less. Absolutely excellent. So again, we must stay vigilant. Another question from the audience, and I'm going to direct this over to Dr. Clooney. What steps does the NMA take in regards to encouraging medical school admissions and graduate medical education to continue to be diverse moving forward? So NMA can't do a ton of, do all of this alone, but what are some of the um, 
initiatives that the NMA is doing to really continue to promote diversity in graduate medical education? Well, I think the, um, the biggest probably initiative we have is with the AAMC, um, because if you think about um, diversity and um, recruiting, you know, recruiting black students or underserved students into medicine, you really have to go back to pre-high school, you know, uh, elementary school, even middle school, because black males, especially over-disciplined, beat, be, e ego beating, be getting beaten down. And by the time you get to high school, you know, you're not interested anymore in really anything that anybody has to say about mentoring you and getting you um, further in life. And so the partnership we have with the AAMC with the Action Collaborative for Black Males in Medicine um, creates not only mentorship, but financial incentives or financial uh, uh, availability for programs to help you achieve excellence, to help you bolster your application, to help you be your best self, because that's going to be necessary as we navigate this minefield of this sort of what I call quarterback sneak, because this is just a little bit, this is just the beginning of what they're trying to do to dismantle, you know, us getting to higher education. Absolutely. Again, thank you so much. We're getting terrific questions from the audience. I want to go back to Dr. Fredericks because you were talking a little bit about the admissions efforts. What can our alumni, people that have attended these institutions, whether they attended an HBCU or you attended an Ivy League institution, what can the alumni do to try to have their voice heard in this new era as they start to shape admission processes? So both you and also Dr. Simmons. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to start with something that's actually unpopular because uh, I deal with this with my alum all the time and I've been saying this to them uh, my entire presidency. I think legacy admissions has always been something that I have been against. Uh, my alum, um, you know, they rabbit, their, their, primary, um, their, their primary complaint often is my kid went, I went to school here so my kid has to go to school here. And I actually feel that that's one of the things that we as a, a, group, a community, we have to be very careful about that. We have students at Howard who come from foster home situations. So for that kid from Montgomery, Alabama, who's a product of a, a foster home is now emancipated, that, that student doesn't have anybody to call on their behalf. They don't have a parent, they don't have an aunt. And I think it's unfair, for instance, if my kid gets into Howard in favor of that kid, despite that kid, outperforming them in so many categories, as Dr. Simmons was saying, that demonstrates that they have potential. And so we as a group, I think, uh, we have to watch it. And at Howard right now, you are twice as likely to get into Howard if you're a legacy applicant than if you're not. We don't use that as a criteria, and my, my explanation for that is that those students probably have more exposure to the institution and therefore have an affinity in, in the way they prepare their application. So that's one thing I think we have to be careful about. Two is mentoring. A lot of what we complain about or we see mm -hmm. as a challenge, and we heard Reverend Haynes yesterday talk about what's going on in Florida, but we have to mobilize ourselves in different ways. We talk a lot about books being banned, but we don't talk a lot about volunteering in after-school programs in our community to read some of the very same books that people are concerned about being banned to the very same kids that we want to see educated. We have an opportunity to work as a, as a community against some of what is pushing back. Not everything is going to take a legislative push overnight, but absolutely every single day we have an opportunity to change what's happening. The third thing is I think in terms of mentoring students, I'm very concerned about Justice Roberts' um, opinion because he did mention that students can take an opportunity to write about how race has impacted their life. Mm -hmm. I have a major concern about that because I don't, what I hope I, we don't see in the next couple of cycles is students not talking about their excellence and in favor using very important real estate to talk about their race. I think that that could be unfair and handicap those students in a way that's not um, fair to them. As well as if you have more admissions um, personnel hypersensitive about this issue and actually looking at that from the other side of the coin, I think we have to be very, very careful. And the last thing always is that our alum need to get engaged. They need to know the facts around 
who we are, what we do. They need to be familiar with the data and not just make assumptions about, I think, what's happening. Because I think oftentimes we, we fail to do that. Yes, our, even when I look at um, our med school graduates, we go into communities where we're not going to make as much money as our counterparts, but we still should be very, very clear about our responsibility to give back, to support our institutions, because every time I have interacted with a donor who's given us 20 million, 10 million, one of the salient questions that always comes up is, what is your alumni giving rate? Yes. And to be quite honest, why would someone who is not connected to an institution want to write a check for 20 million if the very alum who benefited from the education do not participate? And I've been in that circumstance. I've been in Vernon Jordan's house um, for an event. So Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and Jeff Bezos at the fireplace. I looked at them and I thought, those guys' pocket change could solve all my problems. <laughs> so needless to say, I went over and I, I started to make my pitch and Warren Buffett engaged me in a series of questions. What's the size of your endowment? How much money you raised last year? You know, wh how much of it do you spend on facilities? And then, of course, the next question was, what's your alumni giving rate? And I looked to the door and I said, President Obama's coming in, let's, you know, uh, <laughs> change the topic. <laughs> And he immediately said, he's going to come talk to you, answer my question. And that's an example where I should not be hampered by a 4.96% alumni giving rate, which is what I inherited. As a poster, I should proudly be able to say it's 75%. And while it's not tens and hundreds of millions of dollars, it is support that your 20 or 40 or 50 million is going to be welcome. And so having my alum get engaged is one of the big concerns that I have. I think people approach me too much, too many times with data or myths that just are not accurate. One, one last thing I want to say when you talk about alum, we talk a lot about the fact that, all, that physicians, that patients do better with physicians who look like them. I think that is true. But I want to add one other thing. I think the four black medical schools graduate quite a significant number of physicians that aren't black. And let's remember that one of the things we do very well is teach cultural competency. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that those non-black physicians do an excellent job in the same communities and with the same patients that we're concerned about. And I think we have to be cognizant of that as well. We're not just graduating black physicians, and the non-black physicians we graduate are very, very competent about the issues around health equity that we're all concerned about as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And before I go to Dr. Simmons, again, there's actually a recent JAMA article or correspondence talking about just that, that people who go to diverse medical schools where they're actually exposed to a variety of different classmates, different people, they're able to empathize better. They're able to break down the historical myths that can be so dangerous to us. So, I mean, absolutely spot on. Can you share a little bit about alumni engagement on your level? Oh, I don't know where to start. <laughs> I, I, uh, I applaud everything that Wayne said, but uh, listen, I mean, I'm, I'm very plain spoken about this. I say to alumni who come to my events, don't even come in here with your Le Boutin shoes that you can't even pronounce or spell. Um, and you don't give a dime to uh, Prairie View. Um, and, and so I have a habit of going and looking at the cars at events, and I see an S550, and then I go to that person and I ask, how much have you given to your university? I'm of the mind that given the overwhelming problems that we face as a community, that every one of us ought to be giving at the top of our capacity. And that still wouldn't be enough. So I'm not sympathetic to the idea that um, we want to look good all the time and wear expensive things and drive expensive cars and live in expensive houses. My question is, why aren't you leaving your house to Howard, okay? Um, because we don't leave our wealth to these institutions, and that's why our endowments don't, don't grow. My, my brother is a pathetic example of this. Um, 
Uh, he, he has no children. He has no children. I've been begging him for years to leave his house to um, his alma mater. Um, it's a very difficult thing to persuade people that when they complain about the situation of HBCUs and the impoverishment of HBCUs, how much they are contributing to that by not taking the steps that other, um, uh, other alumni of uh, other institutions do to contribute to those institutions. But um, finally, I just want to say, keep in mind, all of this is political. Okay, right, right. and so whatever comes, we should not lose sight of the fact that what is going to occur, the decisions that will be made will be the consequence of political environments that shape the way that people make decisions, even the courts, and I should say especially the courts, okay? And so what that means is engagement, of everybody in this struggle and the necessity to make sure that we are focused on this and that we continue to promote the idea that we are all involved. So wherever we are and whatever we do, we are on this. And so I'll tell you just um, when I had to give the commencement speech at Harvard um, a couple of years ago, I thought, well, you know, what do you do at a commencement speech? Well, you talk about how wonderful it's going to be for these young people when they graduate. But I thought, what a waste that would be. <laughs> and so I wanted to say some of that. But instead, what I chose to do is to talk about HBCUs and how Harvard had been enriched over centuries um, by, well, we know what by, and yet, HBCUs have been starved, and the compounding effect of wealth um, is similar to the compounding effect of poverty. And so um, whatever platform we have, wherever we are, we ought to speak to the issues because we are, uh, have the capacity to affect the political environment in which people understand that they cannot willy-nilly attack um, the rights that people have without um, a, a counter offensive. So I'll stop there. So we have had a very robust discussion tonight, this afternoon, and the one thing that I think keeps coming back is, especially in regards to what was just said about alumni engagement, you know, the height of hypocrisy is critiquing an organization or an institution without offering support. So we have to be very, very mindful that we are offering that support when we have um, the critiques of things. So definitely, this is a dialogue that's going to continue. This is an important topic that we must continue to discuss. So let's give our panelists a round of applause. This is phenomenal. I'm going to invite Dr. Clooney up for closing remarks, and then we'll finish on up. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Please, let's have another hand for our panelists. Great, thank you, and me too. So there are a lot of issues um, touched on today, um, and you know, I think that one thing to me that is the equalizer in a lot of this, and um, Dr. Simmons uh, sort of talked about it being, you know, these are political issues that are, that are happening. And to me, what that means is that there are three things we need to do. Vote, vote, and vote. Okay, because voting matters up and down. Um, I won't go too much into detail about that, but we do know that that really matters in every aspect of our lives. It matters in how, it matters how we practice, it affects how we practice medicine, it affects what happens to our patients in terms of their health coverage, it affects what happens with um, allocations of funds, it affects everything. And so please, please, please um, exercise your right to vote and exercise or, or, or uh, encourage everyone around you to exercise their right to vote. 
Um, but I would just like to say that um, thank you very much to Movement is Life for their sponsoring of this panel. We really appreciate that. And again, I think this was a very stimulating conversation and you know, thought provoking because um, again, I think this is uh, not the period, this is just a comma for what's going on with uh, um, affirmative action and so on. But thank you all again for coming.